Our scripture reading this morning is going to be from Revelation chapter 11. Um, I'll be reading just the last few verses of the chapter, but I'm also going to be throwing in some comments and considerations and some other texts as we go along as well, because I want to come at the sermon today beginning with the end in mind. So beginning in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And as I have mentioned several times now in this series, when we read the book of Revelation, ultimately we are looking for portraits, for revelations of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about. I know I've said this over and over, but I feel like with the way that the book has been approached so often in the past, we need to hear it over and over. That if we come to this book looking for scary things about the end of the world or for the Antichrist or the identity of the beast, things like that, and not for Jesus Christ, then we will be disappointed and confused and possibly even afraid. And we are not meant to be made afraid by these passages from God's word. In all that's happened, even in some of the difficult things that we've read about as the seals were broken, and as the seven angels who are before the throne of God sounded their trumpets, we've been moving towards this. This moment reflected in this verse that is up on the screen, this moment that feels so familiar because we've heard it over and over again maybe in performances of Handel's Messiah. But here, in Revelation, it comes not as a hymn, not as this beautiful piece of choral music, but more as a shout. There were loud voices in heaven, John wrote, strident, emphatic voices demanding to be heard, saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And when did this happen? When did the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ? We've we've seen this before too. Daniel describes this in his vision of the beasts in chapter 7 of his prophecy. And make special note of the part the beasts play in Daniel. It comes up again in Revelation later this morning and again in a couple of weeks. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions... And behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It was devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And then skipping down to verse 9, or down to verse 13 of Daniel 7, I saw in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And this description in the book of Daniel is nothing less than the ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father. The disciples saw him going with the clouds. In the book of Daniel, we're told he left in the clouds so that he could go to his Father. And at the time of his ascension, verse 14 in Daniel 7, and to him was given dominion, and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Just as Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Just this past week, I heard someone making reference to the Great Commission, and he said, we always start with the go into all the world, the peace, and we forget that there's a therefore. Therefore, go into all the world, and the therefore points to this fact that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. David wrote of it in Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Not after all of your enemies have been defeated, 
rule in the midst of your enemies. So the end of Revelation chapter 11 is living history. We do not await the rule of Christ. He rules. We do not await the day when Jesus will be given a kingdom. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So it's no wonder that as the seventh trumpet sounds, and in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, as we saw last Sunday, the mystery of God is fulfilled, then the 24 elders who sit on their thrones, those 24 elders who always come up as representatives of the church here in this world, sitting on their thrones there around the throne of God, they fell on their faces and they worshiped God saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for the rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth or of the land. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. The ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and heavy hail. So for the reading from God's word. Measurements are really important sometimes. Years and years ago, I was putting up a sign or, and, and putting in the base for that sign at a gas station in rural Manitoba. And having had some experience with that sort of thing, I had been made very familiar with the rule, measure twice, cut once. Searles reminded me of that in the meantime, too. Measure twice, cut once. So before we sunk these 36-inch piers for the bases of this sign, I measured out the distance, and I marked it very carefully. I put a peg right in the middle of where each hole was supposed to go, and then the big truck came in with the auger, and we augered the holes, we dropped in the reinforcing bar, and we began to pour the concrete. At a certain point in that process, when both piers were about two-thirds full, and there was a lot of concrete in these holes up around those rebar cages, we swung our crane over to lower the anchor bolts down into the hole, and as the crane was swinging into place, I was thinking, hmm, those, those bolts look... And sure enough, the holes were a foot too far apart, which meant that those bolts were not gonna fit. We had to get them in, we had to finish pouring the concrete, so all I could do is just change the template, move the bases out six inches on each side and drop it in the hole, and then go back to the shop and face the music. Now, my boss at the time, who happened to be my father-in-law, you could say he was not impressed. You could say that having heard my report on what went wrong, my measuring skills themselves were measured, maybe weighed in the balance, and found wanting. And that old covenant expression, weighed in the balance and found wanting, refers to the time in Daniel chapter 5 when Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was feasting with his friends. And they were using the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem. And on that occasion, his boss, who happened to be the Most High God, was not impressed with his use of these holy vessels that had been intended for the worship in Jerusalem. So this hand appeared out of nowhere. You know this story. This human hand appeared out of nowhere and it wrote a message on the wall of the king's palace. Translated, that message read, Mene, Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. It's repeated twice for emphasis. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided 
and given to the Medes and Persians. In other words, the handwriting on the wall, we we use that expression sometimes to speak about some fate or doom that awaits. But the handwriting on the wall spoke of divine discernment in reality. It spoke of the God who rules over all things, weighing and measuring. It spoke of a judgment to be imposed according to his will. And because God always keeps his promises, you may have heard that somewhere, Daniel chapter 5, verse 30 and 31 tells us that very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. See, these measurements, when God measures, when God holds people up to the standard of his righteousness, they are important. The prophet Amos had a similar experience when he saw the Lord standing beside a wall with a plumb line in his hand, a a, a line with a weight at the bottom to determine if something was really straight up and down. And at that time, the Lord declared, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So that I will never again pass by them is God saying, I'm not going to overlook their rebellion and their disobedience anymore. I have held up the plumb line. I have measured them, and they're not on the level. They have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And in chapters 40 to 43 of the book of Ezekiel, the prophet who witnessed the departure of the glory of God from the temple earlier in the book sees a man whose appearance was like bronze with a linen cord and a measuring reed in his hand. This so-called man, who was at the very least an angel, then proceeds to measure the temple. Not only the temple, but the outer courts and all the land around. And when it has been determined that everything is perfect, that it is symmetrical, that it is right, and it is ready, Ezekiel tells us in chapter 43, verses 2 through 4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. By now, some of those references hopefully are starting to sound really familiar. We encounter them over and over in the Old Testament in the same way we do in the book of Revelation. The sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and just like the vision I had seen by the Kabar Canal, And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east. And there can be no doubt when we read in Revelation chapter 11 of John being given a read and told to measure the temple, the land, and the people of God, we're supposed to have that context behind it. We're supposed to not just say, well, I wonder what that's all about. We're supposed to remember those stories from the Old Testament where God measured his people and held them up to the standard and understand that John is being told to do the very same thing. Verse 1, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Now remember, John is in the heavenly sanctuary. He's not measuring the temple in Jerusalem, that earthly sanctuary, which is just a shadow and a copy of the eternal things that are in the heavens. He's in the heavenly sanctuary. And we're told in other places of scripture that that temple is actually built out of the people of God. We are living stones, Peter says, built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God. So as John measures, he's not measuring a building, he's measuring the the church, so to speak. He's measuring the temple and the altar there and the people, those who worship there. And just as there was a sealing of the servants of God between the breaking of the sixth seal and the seventh seal, here between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, another division will be made. Just like in Egypt, The first few plagues sort of affected everybody in general, and then there came a point where God said, from this point on, 
The plagues will only affect the Egyptians. I will protect my people. I will surround Goshen, and they won't be subject to the things that the Egyptians will be subject to. And here a division will be made between the true temple, the true worshipers, the church, and the false. This is analogous to when Jesus came into the city on Palm Sunday. And what did he do? He immediately entered the temple to drive out all who bought and sold there, to cast them out. The the Greek word is interesting. It's the same word that's used of casting out demons. And Jesus cast out those who were buying and selling. And he said, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Of course, that marketplace where Jesus overturned the tables had been set up in the court of the Gentiles. And the Jewish hierarchy had done that because they didn't really want to leave space for the nations to come and seek the living God. So in this measurement, in this discernment, John is told, measure the temple, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now, how is this measuring to be accomplished? We understand that most of what we're reading about in the book of Revelation is a vision, that these things are being communicated to us in highly symbolic language. Was John given a literal measuring stick and told to go to a real building or a real place and and measure it? No, Ezekiel wasn't either. The Lord, when he stood beside the wall with the plumb line in his hand, that wasn't a literal, real event. So how is this measuring supposed to take place? Well, he goes right into it in the very next verse. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, roughly, by the way, about the same length of time as the 42 months mentioned in the previous verse, clothed in sackcloth, sackcloth. The point here is a principle that's first stated in Deuteronomy chapter 17, and then it gets repeated several times under both covenants, that every charge, every accusation must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So before this final judgment can be brought against his old covenant people, According to the promise of God back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, these witnesses will testify to the reason Now, as to their identity, John continues, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So some commentaries make a big point of trying to turn these into literal people, these two witnesses. But the imagery comes from Zechariah chapter 4, in which the prophet has this vision of two lampstands. We usually see them as the sevenfold lampstands that were so common in Israel. And next to the lampstands were two olive trees, the two olive trees and the two lampstands that we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 11. And when Zechariah saw them, he asked the angel some questions about who are these and and why are they here? Why do they work the way they do? And we come across this verse that gets quoted out of context so very often. In Zechariah 4, verse 6, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So in Zechariah, in this vision of the lampstands and the olive trees, We're told these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. As as one commentator has written then, I take these witnesses to represent all the prophets of Israel. Perhaps the law and the prophets. The Lord taught us that the guilt of the old covenant era was cumulative. From the blood of Abel and to the blood of Zechariah, which perished between the altar and the temple. Truly I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. And some have noticed the resemblance to key old covenant figures like Moses and Elijah. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouths and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power of the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. 
And if you're familiar with the Old Testament stories, that just screams Moses and Elijah. But this isn't Moses and Elijah back from the dead to bear witness at some time in the future. It's Moses and Elijah as representative of the law and the prophets and the testimony that the law and the prophets made to God and to his covenant. And like that little book we saw last week, that little scroll that was given to John to eat, it's bittersweet because the message brings salvation to some and it brings condemnation to others. Paul spoke of it in Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The law and the prophets were pointed at Christ and the salvation he would bring. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. But John, in his gospel, chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, and these are the verses that are often left out when somebody's holding up a big sign at a ball game saying John 3.16. John 3.17 and 18 say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. And we say, Amen. That's wonderful. We like that part. But John goes on, Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And that's why these witnesses representing the law and the prophets are clothed in sackcloth. It's why there's a mourning aspect to their proclamation of the word of God, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so these witnesses proclaim the law and the prophets, the word of God. And I think there's another sense in which the two witnesses may represent the word of God under both covenants, proclaimed in Jerusalem by the apostles from the day of Pentecost until the destruction of the city in A.D. 70. That would fit. Jesus said that people who had background in the Old Testament were rich and were blessed, but that they needed to bring new treasures out of, those, out of that knowledge. And if the apostles, and the apostles did, they, they preached the gospel in the city until very close to the end in AD 70. So this fits with what comes next, verses 7 and 8. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now of this beast, Douglas Wilson writes, we have now the first mention of a beast in Revelation, in Scripture. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the book of Daniel, that passage that I I quoted from earlier. Beasts are persecuting political powers. In Daniel's vision, there were four of them. There was the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and then the Romans. And these four empires would come onto the stage. And in the popular mind, in the way that it's so often been presented in more recent times, the beast and the Antichrist are some nefarious figure at the end of the world. But in the way the Bible uses this kind of imagery, we're talking about kingdoms, and we're talking about kings. There's a sense in which we look at this from a a, a preterist point of view. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. There are aspects of this which have been fulfilled in the past. We also look at it from a historicist point of view, from the idea that even though some things have been fulfilled in the past, they tend to echo as we go along through history. So a modern beast would be a figure like Stalin or Mao, A modern antichrist, on the other hand, would be a false teacher, a mild liberal theologian who denies the incarnation of Christ. John said, this is the antichrist. This is the spirit of antichrist. He who denies that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. 
So we got to keep our characters straight here. And this beast, who we will encounter again in chapter 13, rises now from the abyss and he silences the witnesses who have been proclaiming the word of God. Very specifically, they are killed and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt. You have to read carefully. Note that the names Sodom and Egypt here are only symbolic. He's not saying that these witnesses were in Sodom. Sodom hasn't existed for thousands of years. Or in Egypt. He's saying that the city where they were killed and the city where their bodies will lie has become like Sodom and Egypt were considered to be by the people of that time. And the identification of the city is found in that final phrase, where their Lord was crucified. Where their Lord was was crucified, was Jerusalem. So these witnesses are silenced with the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple in Jerusalem. That we have to kind of keep going at this point. Verse, 5, verse 9, for three and a half days, some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth, on the land, will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Now bear in mind, in the final years of the 60s AD, the church had been persecuted by Caesar and Nero. Interestingly, for 42 months, believe it or not, um, Nero had burned the city of Rome. Most historians agree with that. And because he was taking some backlash from the people of Rome, he blamed it on the Christians and he began a persecution that lasted until his death in AD 68 for a period of 42 months. So the Christians were under persecution in various places in the empire. And Jerusalem was under siege during almost that entire time. Cestius a Roman general had been sent out to finally put an end to the rebellion of those pesky Jews in Jerusalem. So in the latter couple of years of the 60s, the church is being persecuted by Nero. Apostles are being put to death. Peter was crucified. Paul had his head removed from his shoulders. John is imprisoned. It's a bad time for the church and it's a bad time for Israel and Jerusalem because the Romans are also on the verge of destroying that if ever there was a time when it appeared to the people of the world as if the word of God had failed, it would have been that time. We talk sometimes about the amount of persecution and martyrdom that people face in various parts of the world these days, in China and in Nigeria and in North Korea and other places where many give their lives routinely for the faith that they hold. And it's a statistical fact that in many of the years as we've gone into the 21st century, more Christians have been killed for their faith than in the entire 2,000 years that went before that. And that sounds horrible. It sounds desperate. It sounds like, wow, how can the church survive? But if you stop to think about the math, Year after year, more Christians are persecuted and even martyred for their faith, and yet there are still more where they came from. Because as one of the church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is seed. And when the nations rage and persecute the church, when the people of God stand, even at cost of their lives, they bear witness to the truth of the gospel and people come to Christ and believe. So if there was ever a time when it looked like the church was going to fail, it would have been in about A.D. 68 to A.D. 70. But there's a twist in this story. Verse 11. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. That's significant. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. So there's a clear reference here to the time that Jesus was dead and the three days that he was in the tomb. But beyond that, we see the nations raging. 
We see the peoples plotting in vain. We see conspiracies against God and against his word as the Heidelberg Catechism speaks. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. The word of God, the law and the prophets will be vindicated. It will not return to him without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent forth. He says in Psalm 2, I have set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third is soon to come. And then that glorious text that we've already considered this morning, the text that describes not the end of the world, but the beginning of this new covenant age, the age in which we have the privilege and blessing of living. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Now watch the, the allusions in this next verse to Psalm 2. The nations raged, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the land. And then, just in case you missed it, when I read it a little bit earlier, God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. So the imagery is brought full circle. These two witnesses, the law and the prophets, who testify to the word and the covenant of the living God appear to have been overcome by the rage of the nations, but then God raises them up and calls them into his presence. And from that point on, the ark of his covenant. Remember what was in the ark of the covenant? The tables of the law so that the people would always remember that they had a covenant with their God. And now the law and the prophets are taken up and God's temple in heaven is open and the ark of his covenant was seen there. Contrary to popular beliefs, never mind the Raiders of the Lost Ark mythology, which is completely bogus, um, to put it politely, um, if you go online and you start searching for where is the Ark of the Covenant, there are all these weird theories and there are all these people who claim to have found it or seen it. Or, and don't, don't believe any of them. The Egyptians came to Judah several generations before the Babylonians. And when they came, they sacked and looted the city. And they took the most expensive items from the temple of God with them back to Egypt. And the ark disappears at that time from Old Testament history. For the rest of time, when the temple stands, there is no ark behind that veil in the temple. It's an interesting little fact that, that when Jesus says, your house has left you desolate, and then in his death, that temple curtain is torn in two, so finally somebody besides the high priest can see what's back there, and there's nothing there. There's a rock that they've been offering blood on for all of those years because the ark was gone, but it was never lost. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That is in the blood that he offered once for all before the throne of God in the heavenly sanctuary when he accomplished our salvation by offering himself. And then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and heavy hail. If we look back in history and we see that this has taken place, then how does it speak to us? Well, it speaks to us very clearly in these times in which we live. Because when the nations rage, when everything seems darkness and gloom, 
when it feels as though the earth has given way and the mountains have fallen into the heart of the sea, to borrow some of that decreation language from the psalmist. When we feel like the rug's been pulled out from underneath our feet, whether that's in our personal lives or in our church life or in the life of our nation, nevertheless, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that is right now. Don't look for the reign of Christ somewhere out there at the end of the world. Our God reigns right now. His promise is sure. The ark of his covenant, the new covenant in Christ's blood resides in the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus offered himself as a lamb without spot or blemish for us and for our salvation. And the mystery of God has been fulfilled. Jesus has redeemed all those who come to God through faith in him by the blood of his cross. As the Apostle Paul declared in Ephesians chapter 2, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You who have been saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and we are living stones, a royal priesthood built into a holy habitation for God. May we pray. Father in heaven, when we turn on the news or the internet or look at Facebook and we see so many uncertainties in the world around us, so many things that make us fearful and questioning, help us to take our stand on that rock and refuge our Savior, Jesus Christ, to remember that you have set your king on Zion, your holy mountain, and that he is king of kings and lord of lords, and he will reign forever and ever. Reign in our hearts, Lord Jesus, and in our lives. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in your holy name. Amen.